For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. In skiing in remote areas, the backcountry is a harsh, unforgiving environment. If you're unlucky enough to get injured, help might be hours away. The thrill of untouched powder comes at a price. A single wrong turn, a miscalculated slope, or a hidden crevasse can mean the difference between life and death. Avalanche danger is a constant threat, lurking beneath the pristine snow. One moment of inattention can turn into a terrifying burial. Let's venture back to the savage wilderness, where survival is earned, not given. This is Outdoor Disasters. For one group of skiers, their backcountry skiing trip would be a disaster. On December 31, 2004, in the remote backcountry of Montana, friends Matt Schuyler and Sam Cavanaugh set out on a ski trip with a group of longtime friends. 25 at the time, skiing is more than a sport for Cavanaugh. It is his greatest obsession, a passion he discovered at a young age. Since then, he has taken every opportunity to ski. With a forecast predicting snow, the conditions for the trip seemed perfect. Not only would they be heading to a place they cherished, but they were also expecting ideal skiing conditions. This trip was a rare opportunity for Sam and Matt to spend time with three of their closest friends. At the trailhead, they met up with Sam's best friend, Blake Morstad. Blake, who is known for his intelligence and physical strength, is also Matt's brother-in-law, making their bond even stronger. The group was completed by Jason Thompson, a professional mountain guide, and Chris Mackey, an emergency medical technician. The excitement among the group of 24 and 25-year-olds was palpable, not only for the skiing, but also for the chance to reconnect with each other. To celebrate New Year's Eve, the friends decided to ski virgin powder in one of Montana's most isolated areas. The location was extremely remote and there was no means of communication like email or cell phone. The goal was straightforward to enjoy some excellent powder skiing and have fun doing it. Their destination was the untouched slopes of the legendary Nemesis Mountain, a mountain famous for its powder skiing but also notorious for deadly avalanches. However, the group came prepared, knowing that high avalanche danger didn't mean they had to stop, they just needed to be extra vigilant. Each member carried a personal beacon and the necessary tools to rescue anyone caught in an avalanche. At the base of the mountain, they abandoned their snowmobiles and prepared for the ski to their retreat. As they set off, everything seemed to be off to a perfect start. The group rode their snowmobiles eight kilometers cross-country to their base camp, ready to ring in the new year. However, Blake had another reason to celebrate. He announced that his wife was pregnant and he would be a father. The group captured the moment on video, with Blake toasting his wife and expressing his eagerness to meet his new child. The following day, on New Year's Day, over two to three feet of fresh snow covered the slopes. The skiing conditions were phenomenal, and the group was thrilled as they set off that first morning. They initially stayed within the trees, aware that the conditions were perfect for an avalanche. The heavy snowfall had created a significant snowpack high on the mountain slopes, and skiing too close to it could trigger a deadly slide. That morning, they remained highly aware of their surroundings, but as the day progressed, they began to take more risks, gradually moving higher up the slopes. Without realizing it, they were increasing their exposure to danger. As they continued their quest for the perfect run, Matt and Blake were the last to remain at the top. Blake set off first. Meanwhile, a thousand feet or 300 meters down the mountain, Sam and Chris finished their run, filled with excitement. Chris captured the moment on camera, but as he turned it off, they heard a faint distant noise, Jason yelling. The word avalanche sent a cold shiver down their spines. A massive wall of snow weighing thousands of tons was rapidly descending towards them. Jason was the first to be caught in its path. Jason grabbed a nearby tree as the snow began to vibrate around him. He found himself at the mercy of the avalanche's unstoppable force. The impact of the snow, moving at 100 miles or 160 kilometers per hour, tossed him around like a ragdoll, and he feared he would not survive. At the same time, Mackey realized the avalanche was carrying him toward a dangerous cliff, aware that he was being swept closer to a potentially fatal drop. Meanwhile, up the mountain stood Matt Schuyler. Due to the nature of the terrain, the sound of the avalanche hadn't reached him above, 
leaving him unaware of the disaster unfolding below. He waited for Blake to signal that it was clear for him to make his run. After waiting for some time without hearing anything, he shouted, hoping for a response. When he received none, he decided to ski down to see what was happening. As he descended, he realized the avalanche had ravaged the mountainside, and he feared his friends could be buried or dead. I waited and waited and waited and I finally started yelling. I just kinda thought I'd just go down there and see what's going on. And I thought, shit, I thought everybody could be buried at this point. As far as I knew, I was the only one left, Matt recalled. His relief was palpable when he spotted Jason Thompson, the professional mountain guide, who had managed to free himself from the snow. Jason appeared shaken, but alive. Realizing that some of their friends were still buried under the snow, Jason instructed Matt to turn on his beacon and locate the others. Each of the five friends carried a beacon that emitted a signal, even when buried deep beneath the snow, they knew they had to act quickly with only a few minutes to dig up their friends and get them breathing again. Time was critical. They estimated they had a maximum of 10 minutes. Jason and Matt split up to cover different areas, hoping to find their friends. Meanwhile, Sam Kavanaugh, who had been unconscious moments earlier, began to regain awareness. He found himself partially buried at the surface, having floated to the top of the avalanche. The first person he saw was Chris Mackey, who despite being thrown over a cliff edge, had also survived. Chris, in disbelief at his luck, felt an adrenaline rush as he realized he was still alive. After freeing himself, he turned on his transceiver to search for others. He could hear Jason and Matt further up the slope, shouting their names. With four of the friends accounted for, it became clear that Blake was still missing. A sense of urgency gripped the group as they realized that Blake was unconscious, buried somewhere beneath the snow, and they didn't know where. For Matt, the situation was even more personal. Blake was his brother-in-law, and he was determined to find him. Blake had already been buried for several minutes, his body being crushed by compacted snow and running out of oxygen rapidly. Matt knew that if they didn't find him soon, they would lose him. At the exact same moment, both Jason and Matt picked up a faint signal on their beacons. Without speaking, they pointed in the direction of the signal and began to move. The signal grew stronger as they advanced. As they approached, they finally spotted the top of Blake's backpack. Knowing that Blake needed air quickly to survive, they frantically began digging to reach his head. However, the snow had compacted heavily, making it feel like they were trying to dig through concrete. Frustrated, Matt threw aside his shovel and dug with his hands, desperate to reach Blake. He felt a growing sense of helplessness, knowing they were losing precious time. About 100 feet or 30 meters away, Sam struggled to free himself from the snow to help his friend. I felt this pretty intense pain, and that's when I finally looked down. My foot was facing 180 degrees behind me, and there were about four inches of my tibia bone sticking through my ski pants, Sam recalled. Despite the severity of his injury, Sam was determined to help Blake. He twisted his foot back around, gritting his teeth against the pain, and attempted to shuffle down the slope toward Blake. Hearing Sam's screams, Chris realized Sam was also in trouble. He looked up to see Sam in a precarious situation with a severe compound fracture on his leg. Chris knew that such an injury could be fatal so far from civilization. However, they still needed to focus on Blake. Finally, after being buried for almost 10 minutes, Blake was pulled from the snow. Initially, Matt thought Blake was just unconscious and that they could revive him with a few chest compressions. Blake showed no signs of life, so Matt began performing CPR, trying to pump blood through Blake's body to keep his brain alive. Jason urged him to press harder, even if it meant breaking a rib. After a few minutes, Jason called Chris to assist, sensing that Blake's condition was worsening. Chris quickly made his way down, but when he checked for signs of life, he found none. Blake's skin had turned pale and he was unresponsive. Despite their training, it was difficult for them to accept the situation because this was their friend, not just a patient. Deep down, Chris realized Blake was likely gone, but they continued CPR out of hope. Meanwhile, Sam, lying injured 30 meters away, began to grasp the harsh reality that Blake might not make it. I saw three people stand up, and one wasn't Blake. That's when my world came crashing down. 
and I was left wondering if I was the next person to die, Sam recalled. Blake, who was soon to become a father, lay lifeless in the snow. It became painfully clear that there was nothing more they could do for him. As a group, they shifted their focus to saving Sam, whose horrific leg injury needed urgent attention. Suffering from a severe leg injury and losing a dangerous amount of blood, Sam was in a critical state. EMT Chris Mackey knew he needed to act quickly to prevent losing another friend. Sam was drifting in and out of consciousness, showing signs of shock. His body temperature was dropping rapidly, putting him at risk of hypothermia. Disoriented and unable to think clearly, Sam struggled to stay awake, his body urging him to close his eyes to escape the pain. After the loss of his brother-in-law Blake, Matt Schuyler was determined not to let Sam die. He pulled Sam out of his daze, urging him to fight for his life and return to his wife Sarah. This encouragement gave Sam a reason to survive. The immediate priority was to get Sam warmth and shelter, but their base camp was a kilometer away, across rough terrain. Matt ran to fetch a toboggan to transport Sam back to the hut. Before they could move him, Chris needed to splint Sam's leg to stabilize it and slow the blood loss, a painful process that involved grinding the broken bones back together without any pain relief. By nightfall the group began the arduous journey back to camp. The deep snow and uneven terrain made the sled sink repeatedly, forcing them to claw through the snow on their hands and knees, moving only a few steps at a time before collapsing from exhaustion. As they struggled on, the temperature dropped to well below freezing, and Sam began to show further signs of hypothermia, sweating profusely and shaking uncontrollably. Matt and Jason took turns huddling around Sam to keep him warm, repeatedly shaking him awake whenever he seemed to lose consciousness. After two and a half grueling hours in the bitter cold, the group finally reached the shelter of the base camp. There was a momentary sense of relief, but Chris knew the journey had likely caused further damage to Sam's shattered leg. He needed to assess the injury more closely, starting with removing Sam's boot, a process that would be extremely painful. Chris prepared Sam for what was to come, giving him a rag to bite down on as they slowly and carefully removed the boot. As the boot came off, the severity of Sam's injury became clear. The damage was far worse than anticipated, with internal bleeding reaching a critical level that could prove fatal if not controlled. Unfortunately, there was little they could do to stop the bleeding. Sam needed immediate surgery, but with no mobile phone signal and darkness making it too dangerous to ski out, all they could do was stay by his side and hope he would survive the night. The group decided to take turns watching over Sam until morning, their thoughts drifting to their friend Blake who lay outside in the snow. The following day, Sam was still alive but deteriorating quickly. Having lost over a third of his blood and in desperate need of a transfusion, they needed to summon help immediately. As they prepared to head out, they realized they were missing essential equipment, Blake's ski poles. No one wanted to revisit the site where Blake had died, but Chris volunteered to go. Following their tracks from the night before, Chris hesitated as he relived the trauma of the previous day. He found Blake and retrieved the ski poles, feeling an unexpected sense of peace in the quiet solitude of the mountain. When Chris returned, he and Matt skied as quickly as they could for four hours through dangerous avalanche terrain until they reached the base of the mountain, where they had left their snowmobiles. From there, they were just an hour's drive from reaching mobile phone contact. However, their relief turned to frustration when the snowmobiles refused to start. Without them, they faced a cross-country ski that could take a full day. A daunting prospect as a storm front was moving in, threatening to make a helicopter rescue impossible. As they grappled with the snowmobile, knowing that Sam's life was in danger and no one else even knew they were in trouble, Chris finally decided he had no choice but to ski on alone in search of help. But as soon after he began the trek, he could hear the welcomed sound of a snowmobile. I'm out in the middle of this big field, and I hear the snowmobile belch to life, and that frustration and anxiety quickly melted away, Chris recalled. Once Matt and Chris emerged from the shadow of the mountain, he quickly turned on his mobile phone and, with a faint signal, managed to contact search and rescue. He urgently informed them of Sam Cavanaugh's critical condition, 
emphasizing the need for immediate medical attention and helicopter rescue. Back on the mountain, Sam's condition was rapidly worsening. He became increasingly aware of the smell of decaying flesh from his leg, indicating he was running out of time. He struggled to maintain hope, determined to survive despite the odds. I was really worried and concerned for my life. I didn't like the occasional whiff or smell that I would get from the decaying flesh. I knew that life was slipping from me but you have to hope that it's not over. My time wasn't done. I wasn't finished, Sam proclaimed. Meanwhile, Jason and Sam could hear the sound of a distant helicopter growing closer, giving them hope. However, the helicopter would draw near and then fade away again, leaving them in confusion and fear. Despite clearly seeing the helicopter, they were unsure if the pilot could see them. Moments of hope turned into despair as the sound of the helicopter's rotors gradually disappeared into the distance, leaving them in silence. Meanwhile, Chris and Matt, having made it back to the safety of their truck, received news of the aborted rescue attempt. Search and rescue informed them that the severe snowstorm, with 60 inches or 150 centimeters of new snow, made it impossible to land the helicopter. Chris insisted that their friend would die if help didn't arrive that night, fearing they would lose another life. Back at camp, the mood was desperate. Sam's leg was beginning to decompose and with no antibiotics to stop the spread of toxins, his organs were starting to shut down. When he tried to sit up to relieve himself, a sudden rush of blood poured from his leg, releasing a terrible stench of decay. The situation was becoming increasingly dire, and Sam felt he had reached his limit. The rescue teams were grounded due to the fierce snowstorm. Chris and Matt had battled their way back to camp, finding Sam still alive but in a precarious state. He had lost a significant amount of blood, and it was clear they were racing against time to get him to a hospital. Dragging Sam down the mountain risked further blood loss and likely death, but an airlift seemed impossible due to the deep snow around the camp. Realizing they had no other option, Chris suggested creating a makeshift helipad by packing down the snow with their skis, knowing that if the helicopter couldn't land, Sam wouldn't survive. As they worked, a medical team managed to reach them through the blizzard, bringing antibiotics and pain medication to stabilize Sam until a helicopter could land. The doctor who assessed Sam was shocked by the extent of the infection and tissue decomposition, and it became evident that his condition had reached a critical stage. With no other choice, the group prepared to drag Sam down the mountain, wrapping him in a sleeping bag and bracing themselves for the grueling task ahead. The probability of Sam dying during the descent was high, and the situation seemed hopeless. As they were about to begin, they received word that the helicopter pilots would attempt another landing. The helicopter approached and the sound grew louder. We immediately started going to this makeshift landing zone that Chris and Matt had stomped out with their skis. Suddenly, you hear the helicopter flying in and it's getting louder. Now, you can feel the wind, the rotor wash and crystals of snow hitting your face for the first time in 48 hours. I didn't feel pain. I was taken away from that, and I was rescued, Sam recalled. Sam Cavanaugh was airlifted to safety and flown to the hospital, where he underwent an emergency operation on his shattered leg. Initially facing three years of reconstructive surgery, he opted to have his limb amputated two weeks later. Two weeks after his leg amputation, a pursuit that faded previously, Sam Cavanaugh got back on his road bike with help from his wife, Sarah, determined to ride again with only one leg with the goal of being a Paralympian. Cycling became a crucial part of Sam's rehabilitation, and with the help of a special prosthetic, something extraordinary happened. It made him feel whole again. His new perspective on life, realizing it could be gone instantly, reignited his desire to pursue cycling like never before. Revisiting the idea of turning professional, this time, he was determined to find out what he could achieve. Sam devoted himself entirely to cycling, fueled by the resolve of someone who had narrowly escaped death and was committed to living life to its fullest. His dedication paid off as he quickly rose through the cycling ranks. Small victories led to bigger ones, and at the 2012 U.S. Paralympic Cycling Team Trials, Sam won the competition with a time that would have qualified him as a professional in the able-bodied category finishing just behind a rider with two legs. 
he went on to win the bronze medal at the 2012 London Paralympic Games, the biggest international competition of his life. Today, Sam Cavanaugh works as a civil engineer in Montana and is a motivational speaker. Following the ordeal, Chris Mackey pursued a medical career, graduating from medical school in 2010 and now works as a hospital doctor in North Dakota. Matt Schuyler remains in Montana with his three young children, while Jason Thompson continues his work as a mountain guide worldwide. As for Sam, his journey from near death to the Paralympic world stage is a testament to his resilience and determination. Sam would state, I've become an exceptional biker. I walk in the mountains. I run around with my daughter and my wife. The whole experience has taught me to live and love life, but it's emotional to think of losing Blake, not just because he was a great guy, but also because he left a part of him in my heart. It's great to know that I've had people in my life have that impact on me because I know ultimately that makes me a better person. The mountains don't care if you're experienced or new. They don't discriminate between a thrill seeker and a fool. Safety isn't just a consideration. It's a mindset, a ritual, a commitment. If you're heading into the backcountry, you're entering a world where mistakes can be fatal, where complacency can cost you everything. Preparation starts before you even set foot on the snow. Know the terrain, check avalanche forecasts, and understand the conditions. Never go without the essentials, an avalanche beacon, shovel, and probe. These aren't just pieces of gear, they're lifelines. Train yourself to use them until it's second nature. In the backcountry, seconds count, and hesitation is a luxury you can't afford. Always travel with a partner or group because out there, it's not just your life in your hands, but theirs too. When an avalanche hits, it's like the earth opens up beneath you. Don't panic, even though every instinct will scream at you to do so. Try to stay on top of the moving snow. Swim with everything you've got. If you're caught, make an air pocket with your hands in front of your face. It's a small act that can mean the difference between life and death. Once the snow settles, if you're conscious, stay calm and breathe slowly to conserve oxygen. If you're on the surface and someone is buried, the clock is ticking. Remember, you have 15 precious minutes where survival rates are highest. Don't waste time waiting for help. It's you or no one. Turn on your beacon, listen to its signals, and start searching. Probe the snow methodically. Every inch counts. Dig like their life depends on it because it does. And when you find them, don't stop. Dig fast, dig hard. Clear an airway first. Oxygen is their greatest need. Then, work to free them, but be prepared to deal with injuries. Avalanches hit like concrete. The truth is brutal. Not everyone makes it out. But you can tilt the odds in your favor with every choice, every precaution, every piece of knowledge you bring into the mountains. Safety is about giving yourself and your friends a fighting chance when nature decides to test you. Out there in the backcountry, there is no forgiveness. It is only what you bring with you and what you leave behind. Make sure what you bring is enough to survive an outdoor disaster. If you've made it this far, please consider clicking those subscribe and like buttons. Want more outdoor disasters content? Check out these videos I believe you'll enjoy. Thank you for watching.